everything must come to an end. And video games are no different. But when compared to other media, game endings are quite unique. Something like a film, book or an album can all emphasize their points tremendously at the final moments, with a neat bow, the sherry on top, like whipped cream on mashed potatoes. There are countless endings out there that are iconic simply through their nature of being the last impression. They really stick with you, but they are also inherently static, unchanged on repeat visits. Apart from your odd alternate cut or revision, the idea that the endings of, say, a film would differ the second or third time around is preposterous. This is one of the aspects that make games as a medium stand out from the rest. It's perhaps the most obvious testament of their storytelling potential that a conclusion could be something other than constant. Dynamic, even. The interactivity of video games create all kinds of possibilities, like diverging paths, moral choices, character exploration, or the variables of success and failure. If the connection between action and outcome is particularly bold, it could even be something deeply personal that's all yours in a sense. A certain ending might resonate especially well with you. Perhaps that first one you got was all you needed, or maybe making sure your favorite character survives is of utmost importance. Either way, video games have the ability to let players shape what unfolds in front of them, and to their benefit, even the most simple narrative could become more impactful as a result. That is not to say that games with just one strict conclusive ending are somehow lesser or don't use the medium to its fullest potential. There's all kinds of room for that in other avenues. We are rather just focusing on multiple endings as one of many channels of expression that is specific to video games. And they truly are. You don't exactly hear people talk about what endings they got when watching the latest Fast and Furious movie, or what version of page 283 is canon. Like, hey mate, did you make sure to get the 112% ending when you listen to The Wall? It's the one where Doug Walker breaks free from his unending torment. The thought is a bit silly, but it helps highlight how much this is taken for granted within the video game medium. The concept of alternate endings became old hat ages ago. It's convention. Yet, despite how far games have progressed to employ their strengths, it seems the nature of multiple endings have remained mostly stagnant. It's easy to point blame at developers for not realizing the full potential of the concept, or say that gamers are daft for not getting it. But that would probably be a misguided notion. Perhaps what's actually holding back alternate endings lies within the culture itself, one that has been fostered around our engagement with games as a whole. A standardized structure that simplifies these ideas leads to new norms. It's not far-fetched to think that the very uniqueness of video games as non-linear media obstructs our understanding of it, especially when there's no comparison. Ultimately, we understand the linearity of other media more intuitively than the perceived engagement structure of video games, which suggests the conclusion that, despite your individual experience, it was all a straight path from point A to B in the end. Choice was but an illusion, the enlightened gamer explains as he flattens the interactive narrative. It was dictated as such by the expectations at play. Only by collecting all the bobbins will the true final boss reveal itself to Scremblo Bimblo and allow him to both save the Spagnoli and get the Golden Cannoli. That's the full ending. The true ending. The good ending. Kapoof!
back in June 1983, a game called the Protopia Serial Murder Case was released in Japan for the NEC PC 6000 series. It's essentially a rudimentary text adventure with some funky looking pictures, but its impact on the industry was tremendous, birthing the visual novel genre, inspiring people like Hideo Kojima into becoming game makers, and kickstarting the career of designer Yuji Horii, who would go on to make Dragon Quest. Among other things, this game is notable for allegedly being the first instance of a video game having multiple endings. I say allegedly, because while being a popularly stated fact, this is actually not at all true. For example, the Infocom detective adventure Deadline from the year prior, which directly inspired Portopia, features two alternate win states. And I guess if you want to be really philosophical with this, you may as well point to the first ever game that had both a win state and a lose state, since both function as a sort of ending to the play session. So for the two pedantic, the first alternate ending was in Christopher Strachey's drafts. Thanks, Ahoy! Regardless if this is the true example or not, the Protopia serial murder case still presents a very interesting early instance for this idea. It's a detective game where you do your best to follow leads and gather clues to come to your conclusion, where the presented ending revolves around which suspect you ultimately think did the titular murder. And while the game does have one firm culprit, it's still interesting how linearity is abandoned for a player choice. Who you pick will be inherently tied to how you play the game, and from that angle, the idea of finding the true killer may as well be defined as finding the full sequence of events within the game. It's a more committed fail state that tests you on if you actually solve the mystery. While far from impressive by today's standards, the game does form a surprisingly logical springboard for this trope. The idea that you'd reach different conclusions in the story doesn't just come from left field, but is rather fully contextualized within the present narrative. The game is not showing you one set series of events with a true outcome, rather it's reliant on your personal input. The game's designer, Yuji Hori, mused on this sort of structure in a 1987 interview, stating, In my view, for adventure games, the main scenario should only take up about 20% of the game's content, and the remaining 80% should be in response to the various actions of the player. That is where the fun lies. In essence, he was very interested in the interaction between player and software, and proposed that a more non-linear approach to playing games could be more engaging. For example, hitting a roadblock and having nothing else to do than bash your head against a wall is not very interesting, which he felt was alleviated by his later game Dragon Quest, where players could instead spend time level grinding while thinking up potential solutions for problems. You might even say that there are other little stories to be told in the optional details that ultimately enriches the playing experience. And not surprisingly, the focus on conclusions returned in Dragon Quest, where endings would again alternate based on player choice, and when looking at Hori's broader work, it definitely seems to be a big interest of his. For lack of a better term, we may call him the father of alternate endings, but before we get ahead of ourselves, we should probably ask ourselves an important question here. What even is an alternate ending? So at base level, it's nothing more than the prospect of your play session reaching different outcomes, whether it's through a path at the outset of your journey or by a choice at the very end. The idea is that the player has done something in the game that does not have a set given outcome. This divergence will then be reflected in the ending to some extent, showing a specific resolution to what has been done by the player. Even if it's just an A or B thing, it is still inherently personalized by the reality that someone else could have played to the end and reached, well, another end. 
Granted, we rarely look at multiple endings in games as some sort of secretive personality test that is not to be revealed. On the contrary, it's to be taken for granted that fans will explore all options and chart the ways these endings will differ from each other. And it's this striving for quantifying the concept that has led us both into helpful methodology, but also trouble. <laughs> So in 2017, the Codex Gamicus wiki defined the nature of differing endings with two core terms, alternate and modular. The first is pretty straightforward. It's basically when the player's actions result in wholly unique scenarios that are distinct from each other. The other one, modular, dates back to a TV Tropes page from 2013 about variable montages but has been better utilized here by functioning as a counterbalance. Essentially, a modular ending is when the variables of player action create small changes to an otherwise mostly rigid ending. This distinction seems to mostly originate from an attempt to count what games have the most endings, where the presence of intermingling variables exponentially multiply the amount of endings for some games to excessive levels. In short, with modular endings, it's more meaningful to count the variables to the ending itself than the total amount of potential permutations. So basically, alternate are original exclusive sequences and modular is when you've got one scene with slight variations. And while this may just originate in a strive for keeping a fair tally on which Bibio game has the most outcomes, the distinction is nevertheless interesting. It does make alternate endings come across as more firm and dedicated to one idea, while modular ones feel like they can really go in depth of personalization and reflect the player. These terms showcase how the concept is a bit more complex and open-ended than we generally like to treat it in video games. With that in mind, we'd like to talk about one game in particular that fully encapsulates the core idea of multiple endings in a way that is groundbreaking and perhaps somewhat taken for granted. Let's take a look at Chrono Trigger. There is a lot to be said about Chrono Trigger that no doubt has been said before. It's a phenomenal JRPG with funky ideas and beautiful presentation, which practically forced the whole genre full step forward through sheer ingenuity. That's just what happens when you pull together a dream team of the best in the business to create the pinnacle of their craft. Among them, non-surprisingly, was Yuji Horii again, who supervised and co-wrote the project. His touch is felt throughout and in many ways the game works as a vessel for fully realizing a lot of his ideas on games and player interaction. For the uninitiated, Chrono Trigger is a game about time travel, where the concept is used for exploring different settings, creating a ragtag cast of colorful characters, fleshing out the world building and enabling interesting problem solving scenarios. However, what's truly special about Chrono Trigger is how this theme is reinforced through a meta-angle, where the idea of time travel informs how the player is to interact with the game on a larger scale, most famously through the New Game Plus option, which allowed players to essentially travel back to the start of the game with their fully decked out team to absolutely obliterate everything. You know, it makes sense for a game about time travel that you'd cycle through the same events again and again, because that's a form of time travel. This self-conscious acknowledgement of the game's fourth dimensional nature heavily plays into the endings as well. Since both the player and the game knows that this is a ride that repeats itself and that we're past the first lap, Chrono Trigger lets you manipulate its story by intently forcing it to a close at specific points. At essentially any time in this game, you can attempt to beat the final boss Lavos, which will be met with certain defeat for most of your playthrough. However, on subsequent laps, this task will be made easier as your characters grow stronger. This means the world can be saved at points where other tasks in the game are left unresolved, which will directly affect the presented ending. One of the most underappreciated aspects of this is how the game firmly telegraphs the validity of the endings to the player solely by the time-traveling context. 
it is immediately understood that interrupting your quest at various points is what creates these scenarios, that they are in some sense a reflection of that action from the player, and that this means we later go back into the game and undo the hypothetical vision by progressing further. In this sense, the endings can hardly be misconstrued as incomplete or premature. Rather, they are evidently fun bonuses for playing around with the game mechanics. In fact, Chrono Trigger effectively utilizes the contrast of alternate and modular endings to highlight where the what-if scenarios end and the full conclusions begin. At a certain point in the game, the plot sort of dissipates, diverging into a number of side quests that prepare you for the fight against Lavos. This segment is introduced at a crossroads, where the protagonist Chrono has died, where the most obvious first action would be the attempt to bring him back. However, this is also where the game diverts into using a modular ending, essentially positioning this as the intended endpoint. From here on out, your conclusion will rely on your choices rather than your progress. Which is really cool, because that also kind of means it's a matter of taste if Chrono should be resurrected, if Frog kills Magus, or if the Epoch is crashed. Admittedly, the characters will really strive for that Chrono thing if it's unresolved, but with how the game presents its endings, it really seems like no inherent value is placed on the player regarding this decision. To better illustrate this point, <laughs> whoop. To better illustrate the point, while you could say it's a bad ending when Chrono is dead, it's way harder to define what the opposing good ending would be, because by that you would also have to decide what good even means as if that could be defined by some universal, unanimous truth. It revolves around the question if Frog should forgive Magus for killing his friend, starting a whole war and cursing him into his current shape, or if it's better to exact revenge and revert Frog to his old form. It's the question of if a time machine should really exist or not, considering the dangers of its misuse. Heck, if you really want to get down to it, how many cats should Chrono have for it to be the good ending? The point is that it's probably easy to fool yourself into a maximalist mindset, where you align the variables into what looks the most like full completion. We're sure a lot of people think the best ending is when you retain both Chrono, Magus and the Epoch. Like assets. The rest is unimportant as long as everyone lives and rides off into the night towards another adventure. I don't know, maybe one of them sneaks into Lynx's mansion or something. And you will now now because holy shit there's a Chrono Cross thing coming out, have you heard about that? But this mindset makes the other endings invisible. It forfeits them. That's not real. It's not canon. It didn't happen. Never mind the personal attachment to choices or chance of your unknowing whim. There is absolutely merit to seeing Frog freed from his curse or valuing the romantic balloon trip. Just a chronoless ending in itself touches upon some interesting emotions of neglect when the other characters dismiss Marl's desire to reclaim him. And that haunting shot of her running towards his faint ghastly silhouette in the distance. It's good stuff that has value as a portrayal of loss, and in that light, it's silly to discard it as non-important, because it's not the most complete and satisfying conclusion. I mean, hell, Hori and Kato were fighting tooth and nail to even have Chrono die in the first place, ending on this slight compromise where the impact is severely trivialized. It's telling how in both Radical Dreamers and Chrono Cross, the old main trio seem to just end up dead anyway, giving credence to the idea that this was the intended closer. Not that this matters, all endings are valid after all. Just some food for thought. In hindsight, Chrono Trigger was quite an influential game. It coined the term New Game Plus and likely popularized the potential and use of multiple endings. Yet, there is an argument to be made that these ideas were pulled straight from the game without really considering how they function and are contextualized within the text. When removed from the idea of time travel, 
These concepts may lose part of their meaning. Chrono Trigger may just have such a smooth and seamless execution that the purpose of its mechanics were lost along the way if they're not perceived as anything more than cool features to be replicated. You may have to ask yourself if an ending in a game was intended as a satisfying conclusion or incentive from the developer that the player engage further with the piece. It's true that some games will employ endings in the form of a success ranking, and the way the medium is often simplified in structures of completion and challenge is certainly not helpful with that. In a way, games may have trapped themselves here, where the developers don't really prod enough at how their games conclude, conditioning players to grow assumptions on how games inherently function, to simplify them into boring states of true and false. What is even the point of having multiple endings if some are valued as more real than others? But that's not true of Chrono Trigger. There is no good or bad ending, just engagement with the core themes and personal choices. Perhaps that's what developers should have taken from the experience, an emphasis on how your own ending should be personal to you in particular. After all, isn't that what makes them the most true? Hey, thanks for watching. This one was a bit shorter than usual, but hopefully enjoyable nonetheless. A special thanks and shout out to Chariot Rider for providing a guest voiceover. You should check out the channel, link in the description. Uh, and as usual, a big thanks to our patrons who are All Purpose Nobody, Athayet, Ben Clark, BB the Bitch, Colt the Hyena, Ember, Emrasa, Fran Rogers, Gage McColgan, Intonjan, Jon Nilsson, Kitty Kong Facts, Klaus Morals, Matthias Graman, Miamic64, Mary Mello, Mosling, Nate Kiernan, Nishved, TB Skyen, Fox, Abigail Nail, Ice, Amanda Rönne Idenge, Andreas, Anonymous, Eric Parkinson, Ava Jeanette, Bill Moran, Bortz Frivar, Charles Goldhaber, Chloe, Chloe Strange, Cody Sis, Dave Pickett, Dr. Puntgusher, Esquire, Elisa Tantivy, Ephemeral Mist, Erin Olivia, Ferris Feline, Fluff Kist, Gab Face, Henrik, Il Caesar, Indigo Trance, J Mission, Kiki Silvi, Kirobsi, Linen, Marika, Mar B, Max Miller, Mitch Haley, Nathan Schaff, Never Haunting You, Pink Ostrich, Revocus Magma, Saxon, Scott from Nursing, Shogun, Siluruki, Skyhoppers, Sleepy Slug, Smarina, Suitcase, Sirashu, Sweet Pink, Sivaru Gata, Tobias Matson, Urgent Icebox, Ouija, Bexelbon. Also welcoming I am Gibbon, Moon Spirit, Karate Joey, Hardyfella 32X, Squeaky Samurai, Koro, Jayon Jong, Golden Clap. If you'd like to join this gang, head out on our Discord and listen to the forthcoming audio companion, you should support us on Patreon. Anyway, this is the true ending to the video. Thanks for playing or something, I don't know.